Hello, and thanks for joining us for this RAND remote conversation. I'm Brandon Baker, Vice President of Development at RAND. Today's discussion is designed to keep you informed while we're staying safer at home. For many of us at RAND, a large part of staying safer at home has meant working from home. RAND has done a great job at encouraging remote work during this time. And we're very lucky that technology enables us to do so, but that doesn't mean there haven't been challenges. As a manager, I'm concerned about my staff members dealing with the stress and disruptions associated with COVID-19 on top of their work duties. I know many employees are caring for children and other family members, and even with the flexibility to work where and when we're able to, I worry about the toll on health and well-being. I'm grateful, though, that many RAND researchers and party RAND graduate students are tackling workplace wellness issues right now. They're working to strengthen and safeguard our institutions like workplaces, which is one of our critical priorities of RAND's Tomorrow Demands Today fundraising campaign. I'm joined today by Christian Van Stolk, Executive Vice President of RAND Europe, who has worked extensively on health and well-being in the workplace. Christian, thank you so much for joining us. I feel like we're practicing the ultimate at physical distancing today with you being in our RAND Europe office and I'm here in the Santa Monica office. Yes, well, I mean, it's uh, wonderful to be with you. And indeed, I think we're uh, practicing remote working and um, I'll be talking a little bit more about that as well. Well, good. Well, thanks so much. Um, let's get let's get started. So can you talk a little bit about the world of how the world of work has changed during the COVID-19 crisis? Well, I, I think it has changed quite uh, dramatically, uh, Brandon, and, and of course we see that in multiple ways. I mean, remote working is uh, one aspect of that. Uh, most of us are now remote working when we can, uh, so that is a fundamentally a fundamentally different thing uh, for, for many of us. Uh, of course, there's also a, a real quite negative impact in terms of some of those people who cannot work at this point in time, and uh, we're seeing some of those effects uh, as well. Then, of course, there's also uh, digitally enhanced working. So the fact that we're now talking on Teams and people are working on Zoom, all of these platforms, some of which we hadn't even heard about um, before this crisis, is also really, really different. And of course, some individuals in our societies are better set up to deal with those changes. So um, this is some of the things that I you know, like to, uh, would like to cover today. So with all these changes, how will this likely impact workers' productivity? Well, it's, um, you know, it, it, it sort of impacts it on a number of different levels. So the way I always like to think of it is uh, human beings like routine. We like doing things in a certain way. Um, so the fact that we are changing our routines, the fact that we're doing things differently, that we are working from home, that we are, um, that we are sort of combining caring responsibilities, some people homeschooling with work, um, that we're away from the workplace, for some people is very, very disruptive. And so that disruption in and by itself can affect uh, productivity uh, negatively. Um, we also, um, of course, working digitally. And of course, we always think about digital working as being more efficient in a sense. But of course, again, it's a disruption. And what we see in the, the literature, and what we see in the evidence is often that these kind of innovations and new ways of working are actually quite disruptive. And it takes a long time for productivity to pick up again uh, after that. And then the final thing I would like to say is, of course, that our health and well-being um, uh, overall health in terms of how we feel and well-being is, is directly linked to productivity as well. And there, uh, Rand has done quite a lot of work um, in, in terms of understanding that relationship. Well, tell us a little bit about that. How has Rand approached the issue of workplace productivity? Well, Rand has, has, has taken on uh, this agenda um, really sort of fully in the sense of trying to understand that relationship between the health and well-being of employees and productivity outcomes. And it, it seems like an obvious thing to state um, that the health and well-being of employees will impact their productivity, but it really was only um, uh, we sort of came to the fore about 10 to 20 years ago that we started thinking along these lines. 
Um, and of course, the, 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 the fact is that if we sort of can improve the health and well-being of employees, we can also uh, improve productivity. And that's something that we've sort of looked at in quite a lot of detail. And that's um, health and well-being really consists of, of, of both your physical health and your mental health, both short-term things that, that affect your health, but also the long-term chronic conditions uh, that we often talk about. So the mo modifiable lifestyle risks, as well as the more chronic conditions. Um, in terms of productivity, um, you know, um, the, the way that we typically think about productivity and start thinking about productivity is really about sort of combining um, um, sort of what we call absenteeism, so that people is uh, that people are absent from work, which is very visible. So when you do not show up at work, although it's probably a little bit less visible now in terms of this current crisis, but when normally when people do not show up at work, that is a direct impact, of course, which affects productivity. And then the concept of presenteeism, which is a much more difficult con uh, concept in the sense is that that, that represents people being in suboptimal health but being at work. So they are at work but actually not working to their full potential. Um, so those two concepts are really how we define productivity from that perspective. You know, Chris, I think many of us at one time or another have come to work when we're not feeling 100%. I know I have for sure. Could you explain this concept of presenteeism that you just mentioned and its implications just a bit more for us? Yeah, so it's it, it is a it's a difficult con uh, concept in many ways because of course um, how do you know that people are in suboptimal health when they're at work and of course all of us are not always in optimal health so trying to define that is actually really uh, quite tricky now there's there's many good instruments that allow us to measure this so basically what we do is we just ask you Brendan in terms of how you feel uh, when you're at work and how you rate your health and how you rate your productivity and on that basis we can sort of try to determine how much uh, productivity you're losing because you're in suboptimal health. Um, it's also the case that presenteeism, um, uh, and I, if you're thinking about absenteeism and presenteeism together, presenteeism, presenteeism is a much more substantial number. So it's a much larger uh, number than absenteeism. So we typically find that sort of a ratio between five to 10. So your, your, your productivity loss due to presenteeism is about five, time, five to 10 times as large as absenteeism. So it's very prevalent. It's a very important concept, but hard to define. So, um, you know, I always take some time with business leaders or with other researchers uh, to try to explain that and, and to try to talk through that. Well, when you're doing that, are you able to use some of the RAND research? And, and if so, what are some of the findings of our research in this area? Well, RAND has been very active in this area. Um, so we've, uh, we've, over the last six to seven years, have done a number of workplace uh, studies. Um, basically, they are surveys typically where we survey the employer. So there's basically companies and we survey a sample of their employees. So we try to understand what is going on in the workplace. Now, we've done this all over the world um, and uh, we've done this in the UK. We are doing this currently in Canada and we've done this across Asia and including Australia. We haven't done it yet in uh, the United States, um, partially because uh, the, the states are so different uh, in, in the United States and it's it's hard to do that nationally. Um, so, um, so that tells us quite a lot about what's going on in the workplace. Um, so this is quite in-depth analysis. But the nice thing about having this data, Brandon, is also that we can think about some of these effects longitudinally, so over time. So we can sort of see what the trends are. And, uh, and uh, very few research organizations have this kind of data, uh, which is nice. Well, you talked about the differences between countries or that you studied different countries. Were there differences? And if so, what explains that? They're very pronounced differences, and I think to some extent they speak to the culture and the work environments, um, but, you know, and the differences within those uh, between countries. Um, so what we see uh, in the UK, for instance, is a country that has sort of embraced the health and well-being agenda. And in the UK, what we see per employee that employers lose about 35 days of productive time uh, a, a year, so which is about probably about 14% of working days, so as per employee per year. And again, keep in mind that the majority of this is presenteeism. But when we then move to Asia and perhaps some of the, 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 the you know, the cities that we're familiar with and city states that we're familiar with and some of the big countries that we're familiar, familiar with, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, we all of a sudden see that number almost double. So they're losing about 70 days per year per worker. And the reason for that mostly is around mental health. Um, so mental health is, uh, you know, incredible taboo still within these societies. Mental health contributes massively to presenteeism. So people's poor mental health contributes significantly to productivity loss. 
Uh, sleep as well. So we see that um, you know many Asian employees sleep less than seven hours, and this again impacts quite significantly on their productivity loss. So there's an expectation there from their employers that they work extremely hard, um, and that uh, employers are not particularly interested in looking after their mental health. Um, society is not interested in looking after their mental health, and of course this leads to quite significant productivity loss. So the business case is being made in our data. However, that needs to be transferred to key decision makers and policy makers, clearly. So let's talk a little bit more about mental health. Why is that such an important driver in workplace productivity? Well, I mean, there's a number of different factors, uh, Brandon, that feed into productivity loss in terms of the link between health and well-being and productivity loss. Some of those are the mo modifiable uh, lifestyle factors, such as people being physically inactive, um, smoking, you know, uh, alcohol. However, these are relatively insignificant compared to mental health. Um, there is something very particular in terms of actually the link between mental health and presenteeism. So the foremost condition that, that workers suffer with in the workplace is probably mental health. So we see quite high levels of mental health stress. Um, um, sometimes, um, you know, we get depression rates. Um, you know, this, these are obviously on clinical scales that we ask about in our survey of somewhere between five to 10%. So these are quite significant numbers. So that would uh, entail that one in 10 workers are clinically depressed. Um, and other factors that are closely associated with mental health are also very significant. So lack of sleep, we probably think seeing about between 35 to 45% of employees sleeping less than seven hours. Uh, financial well-being, it's very closely linked to mental health again, and this is a concept that you'll be very familiar with um, as well. I mean, it, it, it affects all of us. So we see that about 50% of employees typically in our sample across the countries um, um, have financial concerns, for instance. So there are some really very prevalent uh, factors that are associated with mental health that are driving this presenteeism that we see across the workforce. And uh, many of these trends, uh, unfortunately, are worsening, and this is before the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, so we see kind of a worsening of some of those key metrics uh, at a time when we're quite vulnerable in this current crisis. So th this is probably the bad news. You know, we've talked a lot about sort of the present, what we're going through right now, but what does all of this work that you've done tell us about the workplace productivity in the next year or so? Well, it, it suggests to me that we will have very significant challenges um, because, of course, uh, what we're seeing is that if mental health is indeed one of the key drivers of presenteeism and, and productivity loss, if, as I've explained, um, the question then is what happens uh, with mental health during the current crisis and our overall health and well-being. And there are some indications that our mental health is getting worse. And of course, um, this could be linked to the disruption that I've just mentioned in the sense that people's normal routines are being disrupted. Um, and so this would probably be affecting um, people like ourselves. People are fortunate enough to still be in employment. Um, and, and we probably struggling with homeschooling, uh, you know, working different platforms, spending too much time in front of a computer like we're doing now. Um, and all of these things could actually, um, you know, affect our mental health and such our productivity. But of course, the other um, part of the, of the equation is the fact that, you know, uh, the sustainability of jobs and employment is also a huge question. Um, at the moment in the United States, even though I think uh, the, the last employment reports were relatively positive, between 15 to 20 percent of the, um, the the labor force uh, might be unemployed or technically unemployed. And that's just a number that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. So we could see, of course, um, uh, we could see, of course, uh, recovery, a relatively quick recovery. But it's also fair to say that a number of those individuals will not regain employment. And all of these factors, I think, contribute quite significantly to uh, to mental health again. So this is not just the mental health of those currently in employment, but there's also those um, the, the poor mental health of those people who are fearing, uh, uh, you know, have fears about their employment going forward. Um, so all of this actually is is is, is a quite significant um, uh, issue uh, for us to consider. Yeah. So based on Rand's research, what can policymakers and employers do about this? Well, there, here there's some good news, Brendan, because there is a really good evidence base and, a, and, and an emerging evidence base as well. So we, we're starting to know more about what works in workplace settings and also what governments can do to actually um, help employers address these issues. I, I think the first thing is that you need to know is which issue are you dealing with in some ways? So is this about physical inactivity? Is this about um, 
uh, obesity? Is this about mental health? Is this about financial well-being? Well, I, st I strongly made the point here that this is probably about mental health and associated conditions, especially if you're interested in that concept of presenteeism and that aspect of productivity loss. So then you are really looking at mental health and associated con conditions, really. Uh, the, the second point is who are you dealing with? So obviously, um, you know, w workplaces are quite diverse places. You have all kinds of different individuals within those workplaces, some on high, high salaries, some on low salaries. Now, what we're seeing in the COVID-19 crisis is that it's starting to affect two groups in particular. One is the older workers, and they are more vulnerable. They are more, um, you know, uh, vulnerable in terms of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 affects them differently than younger workers, we believe now. So from that point of view, they're more likely to be shielding. They're more likely to be away from the workplace and probably be away from the workplace for longer. And so there are some real challenges in how to deal with that group of individuals. And employers might need to start thinking about risk assessments around them. They need to start thinking about how to integrate those individuals back into the workplace. And unfortunately, younger workers are much more likely to be laid off as part of the uh, restructuring that's taking place of COVID-19. So we see that there is probably uh, a real group uh, of young individuals there who, um, who are at this point in time uh, either being furloughed or they might be unemployed and, and, as, and as such might take a long time to actually reintegrate into the workplace. And so we need to start thinking along, along those lines as, as, as well. And then I guess there's a whole group of individuals on lower incomes who are also very, um, uh, who are also, you know, quite vulnerable in this in this currency situation. And unfortunately, we've also seen quite a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of evidence around uh, how COVID-19 is affecting um, minorities uh, as well. So this is something that we need to keep an eye on. So there are different groups. So, so I think if you have a diverse workforce, you might need to decide first on which are the conditions that I'm particularly interested in addressing. And I would say for any employer especially, uh, you know, mental health would be, you know, first and foremost, I would think. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, which groups uh, should should be of particular interest. Now, I, I would advise employers against giving the best benefits and the best programs and the best wellness programs to their highest um, earners. Um, because even though they might see it as a retention, um, um, you know, sort of uh, policy, uh, in fact, actually, um, other workers are much more likely to benefit from those. So in terms of mental health programs, we know quite a lot about what works in the workplace, and these can range from, um, you know, programs that you can do remotely, uh, such as uh, computerized uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, uh, to all the way to uh, training programs for line managers, training programs, awareness programs for employees and so on. Many of these can be done remotely. For governments, uh, in terms of what they can do, in terms of actually supporting uh, these issues, well, first of all, I think there is a, a general uh, employment policy framework in the sense of we kind of know which groups are more vulnerable in this current crisis. So are governments then actually responding to that and helping these groups more? So that's an interesting question. But also are governments incentivizing employers to actually look after their employees? And, uh, and supporting them either through um, tax credits, um, tax policy, um, and it could be also supporting programs that government might offer in addition. So there's a whole range of things that um, both governments and uh, employers could consider. The key thing, I guess, for me is, um, is uh, you know, Brennan, is that uh, at a time when our society is affected by a real public health uh, crisis, it would be really unfortunate if the health and well-being of employees sort of forgotten and that we are talking about any form of employment coming out of this crisis and not what I would call good employment or healthy employment from that point of view. What will the next normal look like in the world of work? Well, in some ways, the way to think about this is uh, that we've accelerated everything by five years. And some of that is bad and some of that is good. I mean, I've spoken about the bad in terms of disruption that we are seeing in terms of practices, and that can have a negative impact on productivity, as I've mentioned. Now, some of the good to come out of that is, is really also a sort of this enhanced flexible working that people can work in a different way uh, than they did before. Um, now, you, you, you would think perhaps that um, uh, allowing uh, employees to work flexibly is a quite a common practice, but very few employees still have access to this. And of course, by, by, by the, through the remote working that we're currently doing, 
flexible working is almost becoming embedded into normal practice. So I think we'll see very different ways of working. Um, and some of that will really benefit employees and, and their particular situations. Uh, so that is one example. I think also risk assessments will fundamentally change as well in terms of actually how we assess the risk that we that we that we face in the workplace. And some of that will benefit workers as well. I think we will see some strengthening of health and safety kind of measures uh, around this. And a third, a third question is something that is almost a bit trivial, but I think I always like to raise it. I think in terms of some of these uh, measures that we are currently taking, such as wearing face masks, perhaps washing our hands more frequently, keeping uh, socially distancing, perhaps not shaking each other's hands and so on. Now, some of these things are actually also will be very beneficial for us going forward post uh, COVID-19. We might see fewer common uh, common colds into the workplace. Uh, we might see fewer flu um, um, sort of outbreaks in workplaces as 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 uh, work uh, employees are more sensitive to not coming in when they're ill. Uh, it, in fact, it's still quite common for employees to come out uh, to come into the workplace when they have a common cold and therefore infect their their colleagues. Um, the final, I guess, point around that I would make is that our personal hygiene wasn't very good either. So, uh, and, and certainly having traveled a lot to Asia, you see how people, um, you know, uh, think about these issues, um, of course, because they have had a number of outbreaks in the past. So I think we've sort of, um, we sort of become much more aware how vulnerable we are in some, some, in some of these things and also what we can do about it. So it, there, there's, a, there's a whole host of things, I think, that will change in the workplace. Um, and I think, uh, you know, also for better or for worse, many of the things that we're doing now, such as me addressing you via Teams or, or talking to you online, uh, will be with us to stay as well. I think many more of our meetings will move online. Um, it could very well be that rather than me flying out from Cambridge to be with you in Santa Monica, even though this is a, a great treat, um, uh, I will be doing this much more online and it will be much more accepted to do this as well. Um, and then the question is, what do we lose in terms of the face to face? Uh, kind of contact that, of course, is also really important for human beings in terms of this social interaction. Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. It's always great to connect with our colleagues in the RAND Europe office. My pleasure, and I look forward to joining you again soon. And thank you all for joining RAND remotely. You can find more information about our RAND remote events at campaign.rand.org slash events. We hope you'll stay connected and stay tuned for more opportunities to engage. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to us at randremote at rand.org. Times have changed since the creation of NATO and NASA, the World Health Organization and the World Bank, from colleges and courts to the military and the media. Are the many institutions we've relied on to keep us educated, safe, and informed still meeting our needs today? Technology has transformed our lives and changed the way we communicate. Speed and ease of transaction guide our high-tech world. But have they made us less safe? The networks that make it possible for you to connect with your family and friends around the world also connect terrorist groups and their followers. You can have groceries delivered with the push of a button, but there are also websites that trade in weapons and humans. Who is responsible when your self-driving car crashes? What happens when an algorithm denies you access to healthcare or a loan to start a business? From cyberspace to outer space, now is the time to rethink the roles and responsibilities of our institutions and our place in the world. Imagine a tomorrow where sound policy drives stability, prosperity, health, and well-being. Can you imagine a more secure tomorrow? We can. Tomorrow demands today.